Today I want to talk about idolizing people. A lot of the religious impetus, I think, is involved with finding people to idolize, people who we feel have become perfected in some sense, who are more than simply ordinary humans, and to look to them for indications about how we ourselves should behave. Now, in Buddhism, of course, such a person would be the Buddha. In Christianity, it would be Jesus, let's say. In Islam, perhaps, it would be Muhammad, I'm not sure. And in other religions, of course, other people. If we look at the histories of such people, we'll find that the early histories, insofar as we have access to them, show the people as relatively human, involved in regular human events, in foibles, in troubles, difficulties. But that as time went on, the stories told about them became more and more hagiographical, more and more idealized, more and more perfected, more and more deified, and less and less human. For an example of an early story told about Jesus in, in fact, three of the Gospels, so it's a story that's repeated and repeated, is the story about Jesus' non-acceptance in his own home country. It says in Mark, for example, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. This suggests that the people who knew Jesus best, his, his family, his neighbors, the people he grew up with, did not honor him, did not consider him a holy person, let's say. And this is clearly not the kind of story you would make up about somebody like this if you wanted to make him out to be a perfected being, a, a, perf a sort of a, a deified being. And as a result, this is the kind of story that historians believe is more credible and more likely to have been early and original to Jesus's actual experience. There are many such examples with the Buddha as well, that is, little vignettes that remind us of his humanity. For example, the first recorded person that the Buddha met after becoming enlightened is the wanderer Upaka. Now, when Upaka sees the Buddha, the new Buddha, he notes the Buddha's bright countenance, the bright look on his face, perhaps his very serene expression. And so he asks the Buddha about his teacher, who taught him, and about that teaching. What did the teacher teach you? And the Buddha responds in a way that uh, perhaps seems to us and seemed to Upaka somewhat pretentious that he had reached supreme enlightenment and that he had no teacher but himself. And upon hearing this, the, the story goes, Upaka uh, said, If you say so, reverend, and then shaking his head, Upaka took a wrong turn and left. And this theme in the story of Upaka is reminiscent of the story we just heard about Jesus, where there's a sense of lack of honor and acceptance among some of the people who first see the Buddha. The, the, the person who first sees the new Buddha is somebody who doesn't accept him, who sort of rejects him and walks off with a sort of a rolling of the eyes, it seems, from the story. Again, this is not the kind of story you would make up if you wanted the Buddha to, to appear like a deified being. Another sutta talks about how the Buddha was giving a Dharma talk, and in the middle of that talk, he stopped and turned to his attendant Ananda and told Ananda to continue the talk because his back was sore, and so he wanted to lie out and stretch his back. He had back problems. Other suttas discuss, in, the, in other suttas, the Buddha discusses the ravages of old age upon him, and even laments those ravages. I did a video in the past about that, which I'll leave a link to down below in the notes. Now, these cases may seem relatively small, but there are larger issues as well during the Buddha's lifetime, such as the defection of the Buddha's cousin Devadatta from the Sangha. This is a story that's largely told in the Vinaya Chulavaga, not in the suttas, but nevertheless reflects a problem in the early Sangha, where the Buddha's cousin, as I say, Devadatta, felt that the Buddha's teaching had become too lax. And so Devadatta went to the Buddha and suggested that the Buddha institute five additional rules uh, with the monastics. 
that the monastics only live at the roots of trees, not in huts, that monastics only live in the forest and not in villages, that monastics only wear rag robes, that is to say robes put together out of discarded rags, rather than wearing robes that have been donated to them by the laity. Also that monastics only be vegetarian. And finally, that monastics only eat food from alms rounds, that is to say the food that they had gathered by going from house to house with their begging bowl, rather than eating sometimes uh, based on being invited to at lay people's houses and invited to dinner or whatever it is. Invited, well, it wouldn't be dinner, but it would be something in the, in the morning, they had to eat in the morning, but in any event, invited to somebody's place to eat. And the Buddha rejected all five of these additional rules, and that's what caused Devadatta to, to move off by himself and basically split the Sangha. And this is an indication of the, the Buddha's difficulties with leading the Sangha at an early time. There is also a problem I discussed in another video where the Buddha got upset a number of times, in fact, at, uh, at monks who made too much noise in his presence. The kind of noise that the monks made was not something the Buddha enjoyed. He actually seems almost to have retired from teaching because of it and had to be uh, lured back, had to be asked to return to teach more because people felt that, that he had something more to say. And finally, a very serious issue uh, that I've discussed in a number of past videos, where the Buddha was discussing the foulness of the body, which is a typical meditation subject among the monastic uh, followers of the Buddha, the, the fact that the body was not beautiful. That was something that the Buddha taught to uh, meditators many times, but in one case, it seems, that the meditators didn't really understand the Buddha properly, and so when the Buddha left, a number of them, feeling despondent about the nature of their bodies, committed suicide over this. Now, none of these cases, I mean, this is a particularly serious case, and of course uh, involved, I think, a, a, a clear misunderstanding, but nevertheless, I think the, the, the broad uh, uh, focus of all of these cases is one that shows that the Buddha was not himself omniscient, they show stories that reflect the humanity of the Buddha. The Buddha doing things that he would not have done had he been literally a deified or godlike being. Then there's the further case of the establishment of the order of nuns, that the Buddha's stepmother Mahapajapati Gotami came to the Buddha and asked the Buddha to establish an order of nuns to parallel the order of monks that already was in existence. And the Buddha denied to do this. He, did, he rejected Mahapajapati Gotami's suggestion to start an order of nuns. And indeed, this happened several times. And eventually, uh, the, the Buddha's close attendant, Ananda, had to intervene in the case of the nuns and argue the case directly to the Buddha himself, at which point the Buddha relented. He, in fact, changed his mind. He decided to... to allow the, the, the nuns to have their own order. But in order to do that, having changed his mind, the Buddha instituted what are known as the eight Garudamas, or rules of respect for nuns in particular, which included the rule that all of the nuns were to be subservient in the, in the, in the sense of seniority to all of the monks. So the most senior nun was to be less senior than the least senior monk. And this is an example of, a, of one of these rules that persists down to the present day, at least as understood in many Buddhist uh, 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 monastic orders. Now, there are legitimate questions about the historicity of much of this. Many people say that some of this seems not to have been original to the Buddha. Perhaps these Garudamas, these eight rules were not original to the Buddha, but came later. Um, this is, there are legitimate, as I say, legitimate questions about this, about much of this history. But also there may be a certain amount of Buddhist apologetics here of not being willing to countenance the possibility that the Buddha himself may have been mistaken, or at least did, did certain things that we don't agree with nowadays. 
There's no question, however, that the Buddha does not seem to have been 100% behind the ordination of women, even though he did believe that women could attain enlightenment. And this kind of thing has led at least the scholar, one scholar, Rita Gross, to say that even though the Buddha was not himself misogynistic in that he didn't hate women, nevertheless he seems to have been, in her words, androcentric and patriarchal. His viewpoint was around the viewpoint of men, the viewpoint of the monastics, the male monastics, rather than the nuns. On this general topic of things that the Buddha might have gotten wrong, there's actually a lengthy thread over at Sutta Central where the monastic Bhikkhu Sujato actually started a thread with that very title, What Did the Buddha Get Wrong? And there's a long discussion of some potential things that the Buddha might have gotten wrong and discussions of these things, and I think being open to the possibility that the Buddha made mistakes is part of what can, I think, give us insight into his humanity. So what are we to make of all of this? Well, to be honest, I got into this topic, I got interested in this topic because of a recent essay by the writer John Scalzi. Uh, Scalzi is a guy who, who writes science fiction, but he also writes on a number of other topics in a general way, and I find his writing uh, very perceptive and wise. And in this case, he was writing about problems uh, with the writer Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman, some of us may know as, again, a writer of fantasy, science fiction uh, material, mostly fantasy, I think. And uh, Neil Gaiman was recently accused of sexual assault. And a number of people, having heard this, lamented that fact that, you know, because many of them had looked up to, had idolized Neil Gaiman. And they said, you know, at least we can believe in John Scalzi. At least John Scalzi won't let us down. And in response to that, Scalzi wrote, as I say, a, a lengthy essay. I'll leave a link again to that essay down below in the notes. But here's an excerpt from it. He says, Stop idolizing creative people. Creative people are easy to idolize because they create the art you love. And that gives you permission to feel things and to see yourself and your desires reflected in that art. But please consider that this is all an extremely mediated experience of this person. The art is the edited and massaged result of hours and days and weeks and months of work into which the work of many others is also added. So the Buddha's message has also been mediated and massaged by literally centuries and millennia of other people intervening between us and him. And in the final analysis, our practice along the path is our own. It's nobody else's. It's not even the Buddha's. And indeed, the Buddha himself made this very point. When the elderly monastic Vakali was on his deathbed, the Buddha came and saw him. And Vakali said that he had one regret, one major regret, which was that he had not been able to see the Buddha in person very often during his lifetime, and he, he, wish he wishes he had spent more time in the Buddha's presence. And the Buddha responds to this rather harshly. He says, Enough, Vakali. Why would you want to see this rotten body? One who sees the Dharma sees me. One who sees me sees the Dharma. Seeing the Dharma, you see me. Seeing me, you see the Dharma. One way to interpret this is to say that the person of the Buddha does not matter. The person of the Buddha is just a rotten body. What matters is the teaching. The teaching itself, that's what you have to keep in mind. Indeed, one of the last teachings that the Buddha gave to his monastics before passing away is that they should be your own island, your own refuge, with no other refuge. Let the Dharma be your island and your refuge, with no other refuge. That is to say, the Buddha is telling us here to focus on the Dharma, on the teaching, on the practice and not on idolizing people as deities, not even the Buddha himself. And to that end, I did a, a video a while back on the preeminence of the Dharma among the three jewels. And I'll, I'll leave a link to that video up here on the screen if you haven't seen it. Thanks so much, and if you're getting something out of these videos, please consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked up here on the screen and down below at the notes. It's 
how I support the work that I'm doing here. Thanks again, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.